Last class, we talked about sequence assembly. We, uh, we, we finished what I hope is the unit on sequence assembly. Any questions about that before it goes by? Okay, good. Um, what I'd like to spend the uh, class today on, and the next couple of weeks, actually all the way to the midterm, which will be in two-ish weeks, depending upon how we slide or not slide. I'll give you more accurate data um, maybe two lectures from now. Um, we're going to talk about homology search. Homology searching is about string comparisons. And um, there are two, what I will say, killer apps in the world for string processing algorithms. One of them is searching the internet, Google type of things. The other is uh, last bioinformatics sequence analysis search, okay, which is the computational biology equivalent. Both of these problems you were given with a, a world where you have a huge database of what you're looking for. You have certain pattern queries that you are giving it. And you are asking it, where is this pattern found? Okay? You do that in Google. You do that in um, searching. And um, there are considerable differences between the kind of searches you, you run on Google than you run on um, DNA sequences. But there's also a fair amount of, com of similarities. And so um, we're going to talk in here. Uh oh, Trump. Let's get rid of this. Okay, we're going to talk in here uh, today about um, classes of what I will call exact matching, string matching problems. Okay? Um, in biology, which is what we really care about here, we're going to be more interested in. Um, a, approximate matching problems. And we'll talk about that, I think, starting next class. But today we're going to look at three problems, uh, uh, three different sort of fundamental problems on exact string matching. By exact string matching, we are given as input a, str set a string, which is our text. We are given as input patterns, which are text strings. And we want to find where in the string is the pattern. Okay? That is the basic fundamental string matching problem. And um, exact matching is more important for Google than it is for biology. But um, even so, we'll see that there's several reasons why exact string matching is important in biology. One is, um, it, we'll see it's a component of heuristics for approximate matching. And the other is that it illustrates techniques that we're going to be using in approximate string matching as well, OK? So today, we're going to forget a little bit about being biologists and limit ourselves to being string matchers, OK? Any questions? So we're going to look at three different classes of string matching problems that come up. All of them are sort of the same in that every problem is instantiated by a pattern and a text, OK? But they're going to be different problems depending upon how many texts we're going to see and how many patterns we're going to see. The first problem is what I will call the fixed text variable pattern problem. Suppose, let's say, you wanted to build a program that analyzed the text. You build a data structure on a text so as to um, analyze it to, to, to build up enough of a structure to make it fast to answer queries. So suppose, let's say, that you wanted to build an application to search the Bible. You wanted to ask questions of the form, is this in the Bible? There's only one Bible, OK? You can have, spend as much time as you want to pre-process it, but the queries people might want to ask are different, OK? Someone might want to say, is fish talked about in the Bible? Is Skeena talked about in the Bible? That's the world where you have variable queries, but one fixed text. Does everybody get that? This is like what Google does, right? Google has one internet. They read the internet, they pre-process it, they Googleize whatever they do with it. And then you can give it as many queries as you want, and they have to respond to your particular query, right? Yeah. There's one difference, though. What? The internet dynamic. You're saying the internet is dynamic. The internet is dy sort of dynamic. But it's not clear that for Google it needs to be that dynamic, OK? I mean, Google may 
It's not clear, for example, just as, I mean, again, I don't know, as a, a Google user, for mainstream Google, it is not clear how often Google refreshes its index. Does Google update its index every millisecond in response to the latest page it has, has done? My guess is probably not. Google probably once in a while, maybe it's every day, maybe it's every hour, says we've got to rebuild our index based on everything we have now. That's my instinct for how Google is probably organized, okay? So to a large extent, Google is not dynamic, okay? Or to a first approximation, at one point in time, Google was not that dynamic. They built the web, a, 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 uh, a, an index, and they lived with it for a while until they built another one, okay? Any questions? Truth is, it is dynamic. They've got to worry about it. But in the context of what we're talking about, that is where Google sits. Any questions? Now, we've actually spent a fair amount of time talking about this problem. This problem we already know how to solve. If we use a suffix tree or a suffix array, what is that? We took as input a string. We spent a linear time building this fancy data search data structure so we could rapidly answer exact substring queries, right? It's exactly what the suffix tree or suffix array case is, okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Fixed text, multiple patterns. Try the next one. How do I go to the next one? Another string matching problem that's important is the variable text fixed pattern problem. Here is a world where you have streaming texts go by, and you have a set of, of patterns that are relatively fixed and you want a bell to go off whenever one of these patterns exists. Perhaps these patterns exist all the dirty words, okay? You guys probably have a collection, know a collection of dirty words, right? Suppose you might want to imagine a censoring application that uh, whenever anybody used a, wor a naughty word that, uh, that, that, that the document got pegged as, as, as dirty or just sent a message saying watch your mouth, right? <laughs> so here's a world where there's a finite number of patterns Okay? They are not making new dirty words with regularity, right? <laughs> but the people are writing new web pages and there's new content constantly passing through this thing, right? So in this problem, okay, you would want to then spend a lot of time analyzing your patterns so as to build a search structure that is best <coughs> for text, right? You know you're going to have to live with these patterns for a long time. You can imagine now, just like we built an index on the, on the text, we might want to build an index or some kind of a thing on the patterns, okay? And that is an, another problem. Does everybody see why that might occur? And that's a legitimate thing. Again, you know, I get Google alerts on my name, okay? You know, I know people go to Google, you can type in a set of Google alert where whenever a page appears on the internet, because it is dynamic, right? That uh, anytime something appears, calling me a dirty name, let's say. <laughs> I'd want to know about it, right? So I have something where the, there's a filter that we put in. Whenever this string occurs, send a mail, right? Undoubtedly, this is the problem that Google is solving in its Google Alerts thing, right? They have every new page as a spike gets crawled. They have a zillion patterns they're applying to it, okay? And they want to know, kick this, this, this document out whenever it matches a pattern. Any questions? Okay. The other problem, which is the main problem that I'm going to talk about today, and about what you usually think of as ex exact string matching, is the world where, where you can change both the pattern and the text regularly, enough so that you're expected really to only use this pattern and text combination once. It doesn't pay to pre-process it. You've got to solve it from scratch, right? And so the world of variable text, variable patterns, is exactly this. I give you a new pattern, text. I give you a new pattern. And I want you to ask, does the pattern exist in here? Okay? And it has to be fast for that particular text and pattern, because there's no reason for pre-processing. We're only going to solve it once. We're going to throw both the text and the pattern away. Any questions? So this is the problem we talked about before, that there is an n times m algorithm for solving it. What was the n times m algorithm for exact pattern matching? Anyone remember this one? n, let's say, was the length of the text. m was the length of the pattern. 
How do we find out if this passage is in the text? Basically, this is the one where we take the pattern, we align it over here. Does it exist? No. Slide it over by one, slide it over by one. If all the characters match, then the pattern existed in the text. Okay? Any questions? Now, n times m is quadratic. In fact, we have already seen a, that, that this problem can be solved in linear time. How can you solve this problem in linear time? Knowing what we know. Build a suffix tray, right? That's always a smart answer. Build a suffix tray. That can be built in linear time. Once we have the suffix tray, okay, then the claim is that in time proportional to the length of the pattern, we can go from root down to see whether that pattern existed anywhere in the text. Any questions? So the good news is we now have proven, if we believe the suffix tree construction, you can, in fact, find patterns in n dot plus m time. The trouble is building a suffix tree is a complicated piece of machinery. And if you're really just going to go, um, you know, do the search for the pattern once, in general, that is overkill. Okay? Any questions? And that's why we want simpler, faster, better variable text to variable pattern. You know, you want one use of the text, one use of the pattern algorithms. Any questions? So the bulk of what I want to talk about for the rest of this class is going to be algorithms for solving this case quickly and neatly. Classic string algorithms for that. Any questions? Okay. So let's look at the problem of string matching. Okay. So as I've said, in the string matching problem, we have a pattern, we have a text, Okay, we could solve it in n plus m time. Okay, by basically sliding the pattern over the string one in the first position, match, 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 oops, mismatch, slide the pattern over one. That was the brute force algorithm. Now, what I'd like to argue is that there is a, in certain circumstances, if we're clever, we can slide the pattern over by more than one position. Let's imagine that the following is true. Okay, here we have a text. This is the text. Within the text, we had an ABCD, ABCD. We saw a match, 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 match. All these things matched, and then we got an oops. Okay. Right? So the pattern does not exist in the text. But I want to claim that we can slide the pattern over by more than one position, knowing that there can't be a match. Oh, let me know you guys didn't say that quite clearly. Let's think about what we know, though, at this point in time. We know that the pattern doesn't match. That much is obvious. And we know that it doesn't match over here that D and the E, right? But likewise, we now also know that up to this point in time, this part of the pattern does match this part of the text, right? So we know an awful lot about the text in these positions, OK? And we also may know something about our pattern. My claim is that just looking ahead and not knowing anything else about the string to come, my claim is it won't do us any good to slide the pattern over by one. Why is that? If we slide the pattern over by one, A goes to B, right? And A is not going to match B, right? And we know that this thing has to be a B because we knew the pattern. We analyzed the pattern ahead. Knowing the pattern and knowing that it matched the last seven characters means that there can't possibly be a match sliding it over by one. Does everybody see that? It also means there can't possibly be a match sliding it over by two or three. My claim is that the first possible match would happen by sliding the, pro the, the pattern over by four positions, right? 
If we slide the pattern over by four positions, what do we get? A, B, C, D, A, B, C, E. That's what the pattern would be, right? Sliding it over by four, we also don't have to start in that first spot, do we? We know that over here, okay, the first three characters of the pattern matched. Shifts of, of one, two, or three couldn't have helped us. Shift of four is the first shift that could help us. And once it's shifted, we don't even have to look at the first three characters then. We only have to look ahead. Does everybody see that? So in principle, by analyzing the pattern carefully, okay, and keeping track of where we were, should be able to possibly slide over by more than one position. Any questions about that? Do people see the intuition of this? The details making the magic happen may be a little bit complicated, but we should understand why this is potentially a win, okay, and why it might work, why it's clear that it will work, okay? Any questions? So the idea I use, uh oh, trouble. I don't want to get this thing. Okay, good. So the idea of this algorithm, this, is, this leads to a famous algorithm called the Knuth Morris Pratt algorithm. We've mentioned the name of Knuth, okay? He was a famous guy, uh, you know, famous algorithm guy, you know, who wrote these famous books on algorithms. Everyone knows him. Um, uh, the other two are also famous guys, um, but for different reasons, and don't want to tell you why. Um, uh, but the idea of the Knuth Morris Pratt algorithm is to take our pattern, here is our pattern, and subject it to intensive analysis, okay, so that we can make the decision of how far we shift the pattern, okay every time that there is a match, okay? In particular, what we're going to do is, we're going to compute for our pattern. This is the pattern. This is the position in the pattern. That's all that that is here, right? We're going to compute these values over here, a so-called fail function, which is the length of the longest prefix of the pattern which is a proper suffix of the pattern starting in the qth position. Okay? So let's take a look at this one here. Why is the value of fail of 3, 1? The claim here is that the longest prefix of this pattern that matches uh, a proper suffix of the first three characters Okay, that's really what they're saying here, I think. The proper suffix of the first three characters, the length of the longest prefix that matches that, is one. Does everybody agree with that? Let's look at some other examples. Boom. Here we have one that where this end number is five. What does this mean? The longest prefix, okay, of this pattern that matches a proper suffix of this. Notice that A, B, A, B, A, okay, is a, here we have a prefix that matches a suffix of it, right? Five characters worth, okay? For six characters, it doesn't work, right? If we extend this to a B, this is no longer this suffix is no longer matching the prefix, right? Because the prefix starts with A, right? So it can't be 6. In this case, for 7, the string would, the, the prefix would match the suffix, but that's not proper, right? So the length of this is going to be 5 in this case. Does everybody get that idea? Any questions about that? So the failure function is going to tell us the length of the longest prefix okay, which is a proper suffix, okay? And what's important here is that once we have this tail, table, this will tell us how much we slide the pattern, 
So let's think about it. We have a text. We have a pattern. We have a line, the line, the line, the line. Oops. Okay. We now want to slide this thing off. The beginning part of the pattern is the prefix, right? We want to know how. What is the lo longest prefix of this thing that matches a proper suffix? Okay, namely the text up to this point. Okay, and that's what I claim the thing we're interested in is. Questions about that? Okay. So if we can compute this failure function, my claim is that we can now know. Um, basically how to slide the pattern. Any questions? That makes sense? Okay. So, forget the example, because frankly I can't understand the example. Okay? <laughs> but let's remember what we're going to be doing. The basic operation here is that we're actually never going to look backwards in the text. Note that in the brute force algorithm, you regularly do look backwards in the text, right? What did you do? You did align it, match, 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 oops. Then you slid the pattern over one and you compared that character again, right? You moved backwards. In the KMP algorithm, we're never going to move backwards, only charging ahead. We're going to basically do one of two things. We take the pattern on, put, put the pattern down, we will match, 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 match on an oops. We slide the pattern forward. Does everybody see that? And we never need to look back again because we know what we've seen there, right? We know that implicitly because it matched the pattern and we analyzed the pattern. So our basic algorithms are going to be keep matching until you have a mismatch. When you have a mismatch, invoke the, the failure function to slide the pattern over the right number of slots, and then compare from this position again, right? Any questions about that? Okay. The amazing thing is that there is a linear time algorithm to construct the failure function. Linear in the size of the pattern. It only matters on the pattern, right? And so, if you believe that we can construct the failure function in linear time, then it is obvious that the whole algorithm runs in linear time. Why is that? Because at each point, actually, it's not completely obvious, okay? But what's going to happen when we do this thing? If you have the failure function, what is the running time of this algorithm? It is going to be... We're going to take one step every once in a while to march forward in the text. We're never going backwards, right? There's only going to be n forward steps. Is that right? Yes. Every once in a while, though, if we have a mismatch, we can't move forward in the text now, right? Instead, we fight by sliding the pattern over, right? So the total number of steps in this algorithm is proportional to the size and length of the text plus the number of slide operations we do. Does everybody agree with that? A slide operation was just look at something up in a table and say, then compare from this character. That's really what it did, right? So each slide operation was constant. We need to argue there's not going to be too many slide operations, right? Any questions about that? Why won't there be too many slide operations? Let me just go through this. It's a little subtle, but actually kind of not so bad. I mean, I should have done that first. What is the time complexity of KMP? Let's think about it. If we have the failure function all computed, we agree that the steps that we pay for are the total matches plus the number of pattern slides, right? Why should this be basically good? If a pattern rejected at the beginning, 
The pattern began with an X and your, uh, the text began with an X and your pattern began with a Y. We haven't spent too much time comparing from this position, right? If the pattern rejects near the end, like we have, look the pattern, e in a string of all E's, right? We've marched pretty far down, okay, before we get a pattern recognition, right? Now the trouble is, at this point we're going to slide the pattern, okay, forward, 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 forward. It might have a lot of steps that we slide it forward before we start actually making successful comparisons again or move on to the next step, move forward in the text. Okay? The key idea here is, again, we never move backwards in the text when we do that comparison. Okay? Any questions? So it's n steps plus the number of slides. Does everybody see that? How many slides could there be? If you reason carefully about this one, okay, you get the following. I'm sorry, I'm you know, not saying this very clearly. That this algorithm is going to be linear using what we call an amortized analysis. How many people have ever heard of amortized analysis? And algorithms. A few people. Okay? The idea in amortized analysis is going to be normal, the idea of, of how you sometimes analyze algorithms that gives you an overestimate of something is that you say I'm going to do n operations. Each operation is going to take at most m time. Therefore, n times m is an upper bound on the number of steps. Does everybody agree with that? An amortized analysis is going to be a more subtle counting of how many, how many steps it takes. Namely, we're going to count the total number of steps that we bound, rather than bound the maximum at any one step. Well, let me think of it this way. Here's maybe, I realize I'm saying that in a bad way. Suppose we have a, think about our algorithm as follows. Each time we move forward in the text, we credit ourselves with C steps of cost, C, steps, C, C dollars worth of money. Okay? And every time we have a mismatch which causes a pattern to slide, we pay one dollar back. Okay? That's the way that we're going to think about this. Okay? If our account never goes negative, we're only going to have done a linear amount of total work, assuming C is, an, is, an, is, a, is, a, is a constant. Okay? For the following reason. Let me go back. I realize this is not coming out as clearly as I want it to be. So let's go back and do this. Think about it this way. Suppose, let's say, that every time, we agree that every time when we did our matching, there was going to be a match, 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 slide business, right? Suppose, let's say, that every time we did a match and move forward in the text, we get credited with a total of C steps, C dollars worth. Our total amount of steps or dollars we get is going to be C times N over the entire pattern. Does everybody agree with that? Maybe C is 3, maybe C is 5, it doesn't make any difference. As long as it's constant, 5 times N is linear, right? Now every time we do a backwards, a, a pattern slide, we deduct 1 from the account, okay, from the total number of credits we've accumulated. So on the first match we got C, we, on the second match we had another match, it was 2C, 3C, here there was a mismatch, right? So slide, that's going to cost me 1, that didn't work, still another mismatch, slide, slide, I get to the end, okay, I do a match and I move ahead anyway, C, right? If my total account has never gone negative 
I claim I will have done at most CN steps. Why is that? I have at most CN dollars. Anytime I step backwards, it costs me a dollar, right? The only way to stay, if I stay positive, I couldn't have done more than C times N negative moves. Does that make sense? So the bound that we're going to be doing here is basically a linear, uh, what we call an amortized bound. Okay? And the reason it's going to work is that whenever we shift the pattern backwards, okay, the only way we can, have, can shift the pattern backwards is if there was a long matching of it so far. Okay? Let's think about this. Okay? If I have a match, 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 oops, right? Now I can slide my pattern. And if I slide my pattern, I'm now going to have to compare this exact same position against a shifted version of the pattern, right? But how far could it have shifted back? Okay? By definition, the total number of shifts that this thing is going to make is only going to be at most the length of the match so far. Does that kind of make sense? Right? If I have a pattern that is matched in the text, match, 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 match oops, I'm going to now slide the pattern instead of making forward progress in the text. I can only slide it as many times as it has matched so far. Right? Each time it matched so far, I got a credit. I did a, an amount of work, right? And I claim when you think about this in the right way, you'll find that your account will never go negative. Because the maximum number of slides that you have had can only equal the number of matches that you've had. Okay? How many people sort of get the idea? Okay? Any questions? So that is why the KMP algorithm is linear if we can match, um, build our failure function quickly. Any questions here? Okay. Yes? So would it be accurate to say that it's at most 2N? Um, it would be accurate to think that it's at most 2N. Let's say it's, uh, let's, let's say yes. Okay, I'm going to say yes and, and maybe mean no. But I think that that's, a, that that's a reasonable thing. That might be very well be the right way to think about it. Okay. The trouble is, to end what? I mean, there's other operations that you're doing, right? But in principle, the point is that, 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 that half your time you're saying is match, match. Half your time is slide, slide. That's a reasonable way to think about it. Okay? Any questions? Now, the other thing that remains, though, is how did you build, uh oh, trouble. <laughs> how did you build the failure function? Okay, now let's go back here. Okay? The failure function, if we remember correct, is what? We wanted to know something about. Here we have our pattern. We wanted to now know something about at each position. For each prefix of our pattern, we wanted to know what was the length of the, lo of the longest match from the prefix of the string to the suffix of the pattern ending at a particular spot. Isn't that right? Let's go back and look at the failure function again. Go back. Boom. Boom. So remember what our failure function was? The failure function was we wanted to know for every suffix ending in Q, okay, what was the length of the longest match between a prefix of the string and the suffix ending here? In this case, ABB compared to ABB. Is that right? So how could we compute such a thing? Okay? I want to claim that we can compute it easily and logically using suffix trees. 
Okay? It turns out you, the, the, the real Knuth Morris Pratt algorithm does this with some neat loops. It doesn't use suffix trees. But now that we, but it's very complicated and I don't want to talk about it. You guys understand suffix trees. You think they're powerful, right? I claim we can compute the failure function readily if we believe we can construct suffix trees. What is the failure function going to be? If we have a suffix tray, what are we given as input in the suffix tray? One of the suffixes represents the suffix of the whole pattern, right? The whole pattern suffix, right? That describes the prefix of our string. Is that right? Every other thing in the suffix tray is a suffix of somewhere else in the pattern. Is that right? I claim that this failure function, what we really want to know, is somehow encoded by what is the length of the matching between every other suffix in the tray and that one suffix of the full string, because that is matching from the prefix. Does that make sense? Let's look at the example. I think I've got an example on the next slide. Boom. Boom. So here we have a string, and uh, it looks like, let's see if I can blow it up, although I think this picture is sufficiently messy, we won't be able to read it anyway. So let's try to blow the, and maybe you can read it. Okay, good. So here I believe, oops, trouble. Okay. Something this, do, 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 do. Okay. So what do we have here? Here we have got an example of a string. This is the string. There is one of these things passed, bloop, 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 that corresponds to the entire string. Is that right? A, A, B, A, 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 B dollar sign, right? How would we find what is the length that every other prefix matches with it? Okay? I want to claim, given the suffix tree, this isn't so hard to figure out. How might we do that? Okay? Let's think about that. What do we want to know? We want to know for every other suffix in the tree, where does it branch off from this? Is that right? This is really the only interesting point in the tree, right? Every other suffix contains nothing in common with the prefix, right? But in fact, there are two suffixes which share the A. Is that right? And actually, are there some other suffixes that do it? Yeah, actually, this also split off, didn't it? Right? And this one also split off, right? So what is the interpretation about this? This 5 over here meant what? That there is a match of 3 between the suffix ABB, right, and the prefix ABB. Because if we look at it, the branching off happened over here, three characters down. Does everybody see that? Why is the branching over here two? It's because AA, the suffix starting in this position. Okay, this is the suffix starting from the fourth position. Matched for two positions. Okay, with the prefix. Is that right? And in this case here, we said the suffix starting from the fifth position, one, two, three, four, five, matched for three positions. That's what that did. Any questions? So I claim to get these match length numbers, it's really as simple as build a suffix tray and then find where does every node branch off from that main path corresponding to the whole domain suffix. The suffix that's the entire string. How many people see that? Okay. So it's really, if you have the suffix string, it should be clear that 
Let's see if there's any help with this. Hold on. Uh, we have the suffix. We can compute this match function easily from the suffix tray. The failure function is closely related to it, but slightly, slightly different. Yeah, question. Can I repeat what we just did? Okay, yes. Let's see if I can scroll back here. This is so painful. Okay, boom. So what is the idea here? The match length function is being given by um actually let me just pull through and blow let me just try one more thing, sorry. I will admit that this uh what do you want me to do? F11. F11. That is on a keyboard, right? F11. Mm. Okay, is that what you want? Okay, good. Okay. Sorry about this. What I'm going to do is make it a little bit smaller. Sorry about that. Good. Okay. What am I going to say? Note that this is the suffix corresponding to the entire string. Right? If we want to find out, I claim, what is every suffix matching? What is the length of the match? This match function is asking, what is the match length between every suffix of our string and the prefix? That's really what we needed to know, right? My claim is that this number here is 3, okay, over here. Because if we do the match between a, if we look at look at the, the um, that if we look at uh, a a b, where is a a b? Right. If we look at this particular suffix, this particular suffix diverges from the main path, right? At this position. This position is one two, three characters into it, right? That's saying that there is a match then between the um, suffix in the eighth position here, okay? Well, what, what does this mean? This five here means what? If there is a the suffix starting at position five, one, two, three, four, five, matched for three characters. That meant that it ended at the eighth position, right? Five, six, seven, well, uh, seven, right? Okay? So that's why we get a three here. Any questions about it? Any other questions? And the other thing to note, though, is that if there is a match of length three, ending at this position, then I claim there has to be a match of length 2 ending at this position, right? And a match of length 1 ending at that position as well. Any questions? Does, that, does everybody agree with that? That if there is a match of the last, if the last three characters match the first three characters of the prefix, then by definition, the last two characters from here match the first two characters of the prefix. Is that right? So this other fact gets into, is taken care of by the observation that, uh, that let me shrink this thing, I'm sorry to say, boom, that what we need to do is, since this match applies over all prefixes, we have to take the maximum match length at each position as we walk backwards. This is really not that complicated. It's hard for me to say, and if you thought about it for a little bit, you'll see this one. But basically, by going back and do running a, 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 a um, thing where we're going to compute the failure function by looking at the match length array and going backwards, taking the max of the previous value, minus 1, or the previous value, you can then compute the failure function. So just to go back to this, I'll look, do it once, 
this doesn't really matter so much. Let's go back here. Um, boom. In this case, if we have this failure function, this spot is going to be equal to, has a choice of being 3, and it has a choice of nothing else, so we'll set it to be 3. This spot here has a choice of being 1, or 1 less than the previous value. The bigger of those is 2, right? That's why this became 2. In this case, we have this choice of having a, a value of 2 or 1 less than 2. The biggest is 2, right? Does everybody see that? We have a choice of 1 or 1 minus 2, 1. We have a choice of 0 or 1 minus 0, 0, right? Does everybody see how we're doing it? This update, if you see why it's needed, it's actually not that complicated. It's clear it runs in linear time. The hard part is computing these match lengths, okay? And I claim that's not so hard once you build the suffix tree. Yes? Which one are you saying here? Okay. Okay, let's say I hope not, but uh, which... Did I, I messed that up, right? Okay. No, what is this thing? I think the, pro oh, the problem may have been... I th oh, I think the problem was I let Microsoft sign, Windows sign up. That was the whole problem for this lesson, okay? Those of you who are going to go work for Microsoft someday, keep this in mind. Um, let's try to load this one. Okay, so what is your question? Let's scroll this down. No. Okay, what's your question? You think that there's a match of two here? Yes, I think that one under the last name. How did I get this one under the A? It's possible it's a typo. Um, okay, so what should it be? We agree that what we want it to be is the length of the longest prefix that matches the suffix. Okay, the failure function we agree should be two. Is that right? Now, what does this mean? This is supposed to be the length of the longest match between the suffix ending in this position Wait, let me just think about it. It's the suffix ending in this position. What I want to say is it got it from here. This is what I want to claim. Here was the right path, right? That that A is coming off of from here, okay? There is a suffix over here, okay? The suffix AB right? The suffix AB, okay, matched the suffix, um, what you call it, AAB, the prefix AAB in one character. That's what I believe it is that I'm looking for there, okay? Any questions? Okay. Bottom line is, it should be clear that, 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 that somehow these match lengths are logically computed using the suffix tray. That much should be believed, right? It should be believed that this is reducing to basically doing a depth first search on the suffix tray. Okay? To find what those matching things are. Then you've got to get the bookkeeping details right, which are difficult to do while standing up before a class. But the basic idea should be clear, I think. Any questions about that? Okay? So the claim I make is, if you believe in suffix trees, you should be able to believe that you can compute this failure function in linear time. Okay? You, in fact, there is an easier, a, a slicker 20-line code version way of doing it, which you could find in your favorite algorithms book, although it's very hard to understand. Okay? And it basically does the same thing. Once you have that failure function, you should believe that the KMP algorithm is linear and can find the matches in linear time. Any questions about that? How we find matches in linear time? Okay. Spent a little more time on this than I wanted, but I think it's, it's, an, inter it's an interesting and important algorithm.
Okay, any questions? What I'd like to talk about now, there are a couple of different other string matching algorithms. There are a bunch of them. I think just because of time, the next one I'd like to talk about is a um, randomized string matching algorithm. That's interesting because someone used it incorrectly on the homework, okay? And it's interesting to see why they thought this was a good idea, why it isn't a good idea, but it's a great, for the homework, but a great idea for string matching. Okay? So what was the problem you guys had to solve on the homework? One of them was the following problem. Okay? That you were given a set of characters, you are given a pattern to look for, A, C, A, D, T, but you would get yourself credit for matching if any set of characters, if the same number, sequence of characters, the same set of characters appeared within a window of the same length, right? So if we had somebody who spelled C-A-A-T, you wouldn't give them credit for spelling cat well, but you would say that they have satisfied the constraint. Right? That was the matching problem that I asked you to do on the homework. Does everybody agree with that? Yes. So one idea some by people vetted off of me said, why don't we do the following? Why don't we write the, think of the string as being the sum of characters in ASCII, uh, of them as ASCII code values. You know, the characters in strings are stored as ASCII code values, numbers from 0 to 127, right? At least for you know, English and then Unicode and all. Anyway, basically what a character code is, gives a char each symbol in your alphabet a numerical value, right? So what they did said was, why don't we go over and let's clear it out again. Why don't we take this thing and for every window of size K, add up the ASCII code values underneath this window, right? If this was C A A T and my pattern was A C A T, summing up the ASCII values, okay? <coughs> would match summing up this, right? Any permutation of these values, when you add them up because addition is commutative, right? You would be able to see that that matched, right? And what's more, they said, look, we can, com we can so, so what we're going to do is we're going to compute this window, okay? And compute this sum, and if the sum matches, okay? Then we know that it might be the pattern there, right? If the sum doesn't match, the pattern can't be there, right? And what's more, we can update the pattern, the sum, in constant time as we slide it along. How would you change the sum of the CAAT window? Suppose the next one was a, uh, a G. How would you compute the sum for sliding over one spot? You would add the G and subtract off the C. Does everybody see that? And so in constant time, you could update this number as you slid over here. Okay? And that seems great, right? Does everybody see this? Now, why is this not a good idea? Or what still needs to be done to make this work? First, does everybody see why this works so far? Now, why is this not a great idea? Could be other sets of letters that add up to be the same sum, right? That in ASCII, I am going to claim that uh, a, what was it? An AC is probably the same as a BD. Does everybody agree with that? So you're going to end up getting a collision, okay? And you can do one of two things when you get the sum match your target. Maybe you'll print it out and hope nobody notices. <laughs> But then you're going to get a wrong answer, right? What would be a, another alternative to do? You could now go and explicitly check. If the allot to actually explicitly check takes time that is linear in the length of the pattern, right? And if the bell goes off incorrectly a lot, you're going to be spending the a lot of time checking. Does everybody see this? 
So this is almost a very good idea. Okay? But for exact string matching, this can be a very good idea. And in particular, it's a very good idea that Raven and Garp had. What they're going to do is almost exactly what you're doing, except instead of just adding them up, they're going to think adding up ASCII numbers is a lousy hash function. That is really what they're doing, thinking. So what they're going to do is take the string and take this window of size k, your size of your pattern, right? And compute a hash function for that string. The hash function sum up the ASCII characters will create lots of collisions, okay? If you compute a more complicated hash function, a better hash function, you will not have collisions or at least not so often, right? What is a good hash function? Wait, question? Well, what you're going to say is, okay, let's think what we're going to have here, okay? What I claim is there are a couple of, of constraints. Well, okay, okay. First, what is the hash function I want to use? Then you can tell me about prime numbers, okay? The hash function I'm going to use is my favorite simple hash function for strings, okay? Namely, I am going to take each character of my string and treat it, if it's an, a base 4 alphabet, I'm going to treat it as a base 4 number, right? If it's a, an alphabet of 4, I'll treat it as a base 4 number. If it's ASCII, it's a base 127 number, okay? What am I going to do? Every symbol is a number from one, from zero to the base minus one. That's how you have numbers, right? Base ten digits are from zero to nine, right? How do you interpret what a number is? For each, the third position in the base, you multiply it. You took that number, the value in here, and you multiplied it by the position of the, the, the base raised to the appropriate power. That power being how many positions from the left you are. Is that right? So what is a base 10 number? 689. 1. What, what does that mean? That is 6 times 10 to the second plus 8 times 10 to the 1 plus 1 times 10 to the 0. Does everybody agree with that? That's exactly what we're going to do here. Okay, D is the base, the num the maximum number of value that your digit can have plus one. S sub i is the actual digit here. Just thinking about this treats your string as a base alphabet size number. Does everybody agree with that? And now you get a unique number for it, right? Now the trouble is this number is as big as your individual string. So to reduce it to a nice number that we can use as a hash function, the usual trick is to take a it modulo something, right? We take it modulo the size of our largest number, or a prime is typically a good thing to do, right? A large prime roughly equal to our number of, of our size, right? And if we pick this thing right, then with high probability, we should not get collisions, okay? This is the whole secret of hash functions, right? If you think of hash function, you take a big, you, you take the number, you make it big, and then you take the modulus of it. You're making it small, and all that matters is the remaining, the residual thing, okay? Any questions about that? Question. So you're just trying to create an ID for each character. I'm trying to create the, the, this thing is the ID for each character. The hash value is the, uh, is the ID for each string, each window of length of your pattern, right? And whenever your pattern matches, then you've got to go back and check it. But what's interesting, in the student solution, they went down. If the, if the pattern was AC and I, the string was BD, right? 
that would score a collision, right? So there were a lot of common collisions. No, it's not going to score a collision in our hash function, right? Now, instead of just adding them up, this thing is going to get multiplied by a different thing. These are going to be different, right? Yeah. Well, this is going to be 8 times 10. If it was let's, oh, 8 times the character size plus the value of C, right? This was going to be B times the character size plus the value of D. Does everybody agree they're no longer equal? Okay, Does that, do, you, do you agree with that? Right, so, so, so the, 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 the way to think, interpret a base number. Again, it's a question of thinking about it as a base number. In any string, I am going to multiply my string, the characters of my string, in this case by the base to the zero, in this case the base to the one, base to the two, base to the three. Now a simple permutation of the characters does not make create a match, right? Now that call it means that it that in this case there's not going to be so many gratuitous matches as there were before. Does everybody agree with that? And since this is a vanilla hash function, we would expect there to be very, very few matches. That's the kind of whole point here, right? The interesting thing is this hash function can be computed incrementally the exact same way the add just add up the digits can be computed incrementally. It can be in constant time updated to do the shift. What are you going to do? To shift over from here to the next value, what do you got to do? You got to jack up each of these exponents by 1, right? Which is done by multiplying it, the old value by the base, right? You have to add the new character times b to the zero, or just the character. And you've got to subtract off this thing, which also got raised to a higher base. So you multiply the, the, the character in that position times d to the m and subtract that off. The interesting thing is now we have a strong hash function with the property that it will match only if the strings, that if the strings match, it will, the hash value will match. If you pick Q to be a prime randomly big, you don't expect very many false collisions. Okay? Yes? You're saying calculating D to raised to the M is not linear. It's not constant, assuming you do it every time. But let's think about it. How much time does it take to rate, compute D to the M? You say log M. I'll even give you M but compute it once and then set it aside and reuse it each time. Now it's constant, right? Any questions about that? So the interesting thing is this is doing the same thing that that algorithm was with a stronger hash function. The stronger hash function guarantees fewer collisions, which is good because this way you don't have to go back and have, you know, unless you are extremely unlucky with the random prime that you picked. It's not even a function of your string. Give me any string. If I pick a large random prime as the modulus, I have to be extremely unlucky for there to be a lot of false hash collisions. Okay? Does everybody see that? And, you know, the so the good, the good thing is, okay, this gives me a fast string matching algorithm. It doesn't solve the homework problem, right? The homework problem, you wanted the character to permute, right? But you are out of luck because if you allow them to permute, you allow gratuitous matchings to happen. And I can easily give you a string where there is going to be no um, matches. And yet you're going to constantly have to go back and double check, right? Does everybody agree with that? So this is the, the, the hashing scheme. Does everybody see why it works and why it didn't work for the homework? Any questions? Yes? Is this better than the knuth morris pratt algorithm? Okay, well, the answer should be, depends what you mean by better, okay? What is the, the guarantee here? 
The guarantee here is that um, if Q is a random prime, the expected number of false positives is uh, small enough that you will get a randomized linear time algorithm, right? You will have n steps. You will compute the initial hash function in order k. Then for each sliding over, you will pay one step for it, right? You will get so few false matches that you don't have to count them, okay? The claim here is that what, when, you find, when you stop, it will be on a real match, and you can explicitly check it. Any questions? Is it better than Knuth than the Lawrence Pratt algorithm? First of all, it's a different idea, okay? And so it's good to think about different I algorithms for, with different ideas in them, right? You might say it's worse than the KMP algorithm because this is a randomized guarantee where um, KMP offered you a guarantee, right? On the other hand, if I was locked in a room and given an hour to program something, I would get KMP wrong, right? I'm even afraid to tell you how to compute the failure function without suffix trees, right? So this is a simpler algorithm. It's simple as slick. Everybody comes away completely understanding this one, okay? So it's an interesting algorithm. Which is faster? They're both linear. It doesn't matter, right, for most cases, okay? Is there a particular case when you should use one or the other? I will say um, it's pretty much six of one, half a dozen of the other. Okay? In practice, people do experiments. There are a bunch of papers written where they compare. There's several linear algorithms for string matching. There's one I didn't talk about that you should look at the notes for, for called the Boyer-Moore algorithm. That's also linear. And some people, when they conduct the experiment, say the Boyer-Moore one is fastest. But if somebody else does the algorithm, it comes out the other one is faster. And the reason why you can get different answers is because the stakes are small. They're all linear, right? Nobody ever died because their algorithm, linear string matching algorithm was too long, right? So, so you know, they make differences. They're more different conceptually than practically. If I had to, had to implement something for my algorithm and I believe the papers, I'd say, okay, do a boy or more algorithm. But, yes? What's the random, randomized referring to? The randomized is referring to Q. Okay, the random prime, the modulus that I'm using here. And this is a little bit tricky to see why it's randomized, okay? So if we go back to this thing, we pick this Q, we, we have this hash function. In a hash function, we sort of expect that if the modulus is Q, all Q values are equally likely to be used, right? And that therefore, the probability of there being a collision that it match the pattern that we actually, that the same value as what we give for our, our um, pattern is going to be 1 over Q. So if Q was large enough, we would expect the probability of fault collisions is fault, is low. But if our adversary, some evil person, knew what our Q was, they could give you a string, okay, that would would um, cause a lot of collisions for that value of Q if they were both evil and very smart, right? If they knew your pattern, they knew your strength, your Q. And so that's why they say pick it randomly, okay? Yes? So how big a Q is typically good enough? How big a Q is good enough, what I would probably say is the other way around is that, okay, well let's say that we agree that if Q were we want the probability of the false collision to be low, right? There's going to be n tests we're going to do. So we want Q to be bigger than n, certainly. If Q is bigger than n, the expected number of false collisions is less than 1. Does that make sense? If we assume that we're using all the buckets equally, which is a little hand wave. Then you're saying, how big should Q be? My argument would be, you're doing these things with 32-bit integers, right? Okay, why not pick a big prime 
nearly 32 bits. It doesn't cost you any more to do bits on 32. Well, you guys now have 64-bit machines, right? Why not take a prime that is big, that is about 64 bits, okay? It doesn't cost you any more to do your arithmetic these days, right? And unless your string is longer than 2 to the 64th, you would expect very few collisions. Any questions? Okay? So don't let these details confuse you. The beauty of it is, compute the hash, constant time, compute the hash, slide, slide, slide. Okay? You're not going to get false collisions unless something evil is happening. Okay? Good algorithm. Any questions? Okay. The final thing I'd like to say, I know we're running low on time, but I do want to just to get out of this thing. I'd like to talk about one, the last of the three cases. Okay? We talked about three string matching problems, and just for completeness, I'd like to mention the last one. KMP and, and, uh, Car and Raven Carp were good for, I give you a text and a pattern, find it now. Suffix trees were good where I have a text, I'm willing to spend a lot of time to analyze it so I can answer a lot of queries quickly. Right? The other case was the one where you give me many patterns, okay, and you're then going to slide new text to me, you know, um, there's going to be patterns that you're going to give me that are fixed, that are going to last for a long time, dirty words, important biological motifs, okay? How do you deal with this? This problem actually turns out to be solved using techniques from automata theory, okay? So if uh, we think about it, pattern matching with wild cards. Okay, a wild card here is A, C, G, followed by any character, followed by a T. This could be thought of as being matching four different patterns, right? A, C, G, A, T, A, C, G, C, T, A, C, G, G, T, A, C, G, T, T, right? So the case of pattern matching with wild cards is a special case of multiple patterns. What the claim here is that if you want to match against multiple patterns, what you're going to want to do is to take your patterns and reduce them to a regular expression. Okay? How many people here know what regular expressions are? Okay, all the computer scientists, the biology people or the math people don't panic so much, okay? It's just more for their edi ed edification, okay? So what could you do? You could imagine building a automata that has the property that the language, what was an automata? You took finite automata, they talked about languages, right? Your languages were a set of strings that match, right? Uh, the deterministic finite automata or a non-deterministic or finite automata was a machine that went ding when one of your patterns went in, right? You could now imagine building an automata that goes ding whenever your pattern is a substring of what you're doing, right? Actually, it probably means anything goes star, meaning match anything, followed by the pattern you wanted, right? So you can imagine, I mean, basically, you just build an automata where you have um, a accepting state for each pattern that you want to match. On each character, you're either going to um, go, you'll go to another state, okay? If it's a match, you're going to keep moving forward in the automata. If it's a mismatch, you're going to go backwards knowing that you have uh, what the prefix that you match so far, you'll go back to a previous state. Does that make sense? So it should be clear that the way to think about these is with an automata theory-like thing. Take your patterns. If you have enough time on your patterns, build an automata on them. Okay? This is what grep does. How many of you have ever used the unit of utility grep? Grep stands for general regular expression pattern matcher, right? So build the automata on your patterns and then feed it anything and wait for it to go ding. Any questions about that? Okay. Any questions about any of the string matching stuff? 
Okay. One thing I had wanted to talk about, I don't have enough time really to talk about it properly, was about projects. How people started to look at the project list. Okay? It's good. I want you to keep looking at the project list. Okay? Next class, I hope, I will try to um, get, go through in the leaps of time to talk about uh, some of the projects. Read through them, maybe do a little bit of Googling, maybe wait till next class for me to talk about them. And then I want you guys to come by and talk to me about things. Okay? Any other questions about pattern mapping? Okay, thanks for your attention. I will see you guys next class.